Previously on the revolution, confidence in Washington reached a new low as America's revolution descended into anarchy. The Americans in 1776 have encountered nothing but defeat followed by defeat. This really negatively affects the morale of this force who really now question whether or not Washington is the right man for this job. Washington made a last ditch effort for redemption at Trenton. Trenton illustrates the genius of George Washington. Here is an opportunity to strike the enemy when he's weak. This is going to establish the pattern for the rest of the war in which the Continental Army will live to fight another day. December 1776. At a secret location along the French coast, a shipment is being prepared. Rifles, uniforms, gunpowder, and ammunition are crated and boarded, bound for America. It is a gesture of solidarity from France against their common enemy, Great Britain. The weapons will aid Washington's notoriously undersupplied army, which has just unleashed a Christmas surprise on the British. The Battle of Trenton has bolstered the rebels. But America needs more than supplies to turn the tide of war. What General George Washington really needs is money and a navy. In pursuit of this goal, the Americans have sent their own secret weapon to France. He arrives on a crisp December morning along the French coast. He is old and frail with a variety of ailments. But Benjamin Franklin is also the most famous revolutionary leader in Europe. Franklin is the man who tamed lightning, a renowned scientist, inventor, and writer who brought the simple wisdom of poor Richard to the world. When Franklin gets to France, there is an enormous sense of consternation. What is this figurehead? What is this great celebrity doing here? And remember, given the way the media worked in those days, he washes up on the shores of Brittany with no announcement. And there are all sorts of wonderful rumors uh, afoot as to what he's doing in France. He's come to buy himself a chateau with his immense fortune. He's come to educate his grandsons in Europe because the schools are better. Every possible idea um, is put forth. The idea that he's actually there to enlist the French in this cause is not the obvious conclusion. And he doesn't feel he has to illuminate anyone. Franklin arrives into a deeply divided nation, no place more so than Paris itself. The wealthy live in opulence, while the poor walk on city streets ankle deep in waste and excrement. This dichotomy has produced new thinking about Europe's age-old system of class. The French read Thomas Paine and cheer America's revolution. As one Frenchman noted, there is a hundred times more enthusiasm for this revolution in the Paris cafes than in the colonies. Franklin plays on this enthusiasm. Now, in one of the most opulent courts in Europe, the home of Marie Antoinette, Franklin presents a simple yet carefully crafted portrait of America and all things American. Picture me very plainly dressed, wearing my thin gray straight hair that peeps out from under my only coiffure, a fine fur cap which comes down to my forehead almost to my spectacles. Think how this must appear among the powdered heads of Paris. Benjamin Franklin. Franklin plays on this romance. He wears, he dresses very plainly. He wears a beaver cap. And he becomes kind of a fad. Uh, the women love to be around Franklin. Uh, they think there's something kind of very romantic about this backwoodsman who's here in their midst. Before long, all the fashionable women are wearing their hair in a style that mimics Franklin's fur cap. They call the style a la Franklin. But not all quarters are equally charmed. December 28, 1776. Ben Franklin arrives at Versailles, home to King Louis XVI. It seems like a fool's errand when you think about it. Franklin is sent to an absolute monarchy to ask them to fund a revolution against a king. But the truth is that the, the animus on the French part against the English is so great um, that this is a very easy argument to make. 
Franklin is greeted by France's foreign minister, the crafty Comte de Vergen. Vergen is the one behind France's covert arms shipments. Anyone in his right mind would have assumed that the best thing to do would have been to let the colonies and, and England destroy each other mutually and not to intervene. But he is dead set on revenge. It's the one thing he needs to accomplish. And he could not be more eager. He is intrigued by the revolution. But France needs to know they are backing a winner. Franklin's attuned sense of gamesmanship tells him the time is not right. That, and the fact King Louis XVI refuses to meet with him. But without France, the threadbare American Revolution is in peril. For now, Franklin will have to wait and pin his hopes on events 3,000 miles away, where only a great American victory could budge the French. But that couldn't seem less likely. Back in New Jersey, the Continental Army is in bad shape. The Americans have not yet figured out how to feed and supply the army. John Adams, the always outspoken member of Congress, complains. Our army is an object of wretchedness enough to fill a human mind with horror. Disgraced, defeated, discontented, dispirited, diseased, naked, undisciplined, eaten up with vermin. No clothes, beds, or blankets. No medicines, no victuals but salt pork and flour. And as winter turns to spring, the problems only worsen. No one is joining the army. And officers sent on recruiting missions must dig deeper to fill the quotas for new recruits. The colonists, like every generation before or after, seem convinced that the war is going to be over by Christmas. When the war isn't over by Christmas, Washington has a hard, hard time recruiting soldiers. And it's in 1777 that we see many states beginning to offer uh, significantly increased bounties. That's a cash payment for enlistment. Uh, service in the Continental Army is now offered as an alternative to corporal punishment when you're brought into court. Service in the Continental Army is encouraged for vagrants. The shortages of trained soldiers hits the Army hard. No place more than the Northern American outpost of Fort Ticonderoga where America's inexperienced recruits are about to become the target of a major British attack. America's envoy in Paris, Benjamin Franklin, has made his first overtures to the French, an attempt to get the European power to join in the fight against their age-old enemy, England. But for now, the elder statesman has come away empty-handed. Swaying the French will take a major American victory back in the colonies, where the British are getting ready to mount a new round of assaults. June 1777. Just south of Montreal, Canada, a new British general has arrived in America. General John Burgoyne surrounds himself with all the trappings that wealth and status afford. He has recently returned to the colonies, where he witnessed the British loss of Boston just two years earlier. Burgoyne's goal, to take revenge and end the war, whatever the cost. It is an end game he has staked his career on. John Burgoyne has always led the good life. A gambler, a military man by career, a playwright by hobby, a social climber by marriage, Gentleman Johnny, as his soldiers call him, leans towards the dramatic. Before his return to America in June, the cocky Burgoyne wagers that he will have the war won by Christmas. Charles Fox, a member of Parliament who stood in opposition to the war, takes the bet with a warning. Be not over sanguine. I believe when you return to England, you will be a prisoner on parole. Charles Fox. As commander of Britain's northern forces, Burgoyne aims to take the Hudson River, the vital waterway that separates the northern colonies from the southern colonies. 
It's important to realize that in the 18th century, there are no bridges across this river. There are only a limited number of crossing points. If you control those points, you control key terrain, and you were able to sever the lines of communication that the colonists are able to use to coordinate their actions between Boston and Philadelphia, and certainly prohibit the transfer of troops from one side of the river to the other. The British plan requires precise coordination across great distances. Burgoyne's force will move south down the Hudson to meet up with the man in charge for the British, General William Howe, whose forces will march north from New York City. Burgoyne's first target is a remote northern outpost, the mighty Fort Ticonderoga. People referred to it as the Gibraltar of the North or the Gibraltar of North America. It was, by all standards, the most spectacular fortress in North America. Angled bastions, very defensible, and it sits astride this very, very strategic water corridor. July 2nd, 1777. General Burgoyne's force of 8,000 descends upon Fort Ticonderoga. The undermanned Americans are at a mighty disadvantage. Just 2,500 Continentals guard the fort. Skirmishes break out around the stronghold as British soldiers snipe at the Americans. But taking the fort will require a strategic advantage. Fort Ticonderoga sits on a peninsula surrounded by three mountains, but the lean American forces can only defend two of them. The steepest and most formidable, the aptly named Mount Defiance, is left unprotected. But from its ridge, artillery has an easy shot into the fort. It is the weak spot that Burgoyne will exploit. July 5th, Burgoyne dispatches a unit to the west side of Mount Defiance. Their mission, to drag their cannon to the top. It is a treacherous climb, but out of sight of the Americans. By noon, they crest the ridge and position themselves for a clear shot into the fort. With one move, Burgoyne puts the Americans in an indefensible position. And without firing their cannon once, leave the outmaneuvered Americans no choice but to retreat. It is an easy win for Burgoyne and bolsters his belief that the campaign to take the Hudson River will be a simple one. News of the fall of Fort Ticonderoga reaches Paris, where Benjamin Franklin has been closely monitoring the war. He's constantly waiting for his mail. I mean, none of our impatience for our mail could possibly equal what Franklin must have felt at that point. The ignorance is crippling. But sometimes ignorance is bliss. That the undermanned American army has been forced to retreat in the face of an attack is the last thing Franklin wants to hear. On top of that, he has made little progress with King Louis XVI. Franklin is, after all, the representative of rebels. He is fraught with frustration. There is nothing better to do here than drink. How can we fool ourselves that France might understand America better than Britain? How can we fool ourselves that a monarchy will help Republicans revolt against their monarch? Benjamin Franklin. The fall of Fort Ty hits General Washington's desk with a thud. His soldiers lost it without so much as a fight. And now the British Army is on the move. 7,000 soldiers are heading down the Hudson. The rest are stationed in New York City. Washington flounders and begins moving his troops up and down the river, hedging his bet against where the Redcoats might attack next. General Washington may be conflicted, but so too are the British. 
Their commander, William Howe, has gathered up his 13,000 troops and set sail from New York City. Destination unknown. Howe is torn. He is expected to move up the Hudson to aid Burgoyne, but he can't escape his own designs, a fixation on conquering Philadelphia, the rebel capital. His decision, when it comes, will change the course of the war. The mighty Fort Ticonderoga, the gateway to the Hudson River Valley, has fallen to the British without so much as a shot fired. It is another defeat for the undermanned Continental Army and is an ominous start to the summer of 1777. Across the ocean in France, Benjamin Franklin's waiting game continues. Franklin is biding his time, looking for news from America, some victory that would open the gates to Versailles, would convince the French to join the war. But he keeps his intentions to himself. It is a secrecy that breeds intrigue. For the first year that he's there, there's a real question. Is he here because he's running away from the American Revolution? Is he here to undermine it, or is he here to underwrite it? Desperate to find out more, both France and England surround Franklin with spies. It turns out, in retrospect, that his own secretary was a spy, and that anything that crossed Franklin's desk was sent back within the week via a little bottle sunk beneath a tree in the Tuileries to the British government. And those dispatches arrived regularly 72 hours later because of the espionage. Franklin realized the only way he could keep a secret was to keep it to himself. And he's very, very closed-mouthed, plays his cards very close to the chest. Franklin's silence is a calculated diplomatic strategy, akin to his favorite game, chess. Life is a kind of chess in which we have points to gain and competitors to contend with. By playing at chess, we learn not to make our moves too hastily. Benjamin Franklin. Franklin follows his own advice too well for some. But he knows the time will come when he finally gets to play his next move. Back across the ocean in America, British General Howe remains adrift off the coast of New York City. 13,000 soldiers on 260 ships still don't know where they are headed. John Burgoyne's plan calls for General Howe to head up the Hudson, yet Howe is intent on Philadelphia. Revenge for his embarrassing losses at Trenton and Princeton. As Howe is obsessed with holding Philadelphia, sustaining Philadelphia, situated almost exactly in the center of the 13 colonies geographically because it's the political capital. Um, it's where the Continental Congress is, uh, resides. It's an important strategic center too, both commercially um, as well as politically. Howe makes his decision. He will abandon Burgoyne, his northern army, and the Hudson campaign. He will invade Philadelphia. In one move, he changes the course of the war. August 22, 1777, Hartsville, Pennsylvania. American scouts bring word to Washington that Howe's fleet has entered the Chesapeake Bay. Their target is now clear. They are headed for the rebel capital. Washington immediately sets his army in motion, marching south through Philadelphia. Three days later, the British land at Elk Point, Maryland, and begin their northward march. The two armies are now on a collision course. September 11th, 1777, Chad's Ford, Pennsylvania. Washington positions his forces along the banks of a tributary called Brandywine Creek. It is here that he will make his stand against the advancing British. Brandywine Creek is the perfect place for a defense. There are only a few crossings along this stretch where troops can be transported from bank to bank, and Washington has them covered. By 7 a.m., the British reach the banks directly across the river from the main force of the Americans. Musket and artillery fire erupt between the two armies. 
25,000 soldiers will clash on this day. The battle, intense and bloody. In the thick of the fighting, the Continental Army makes an alarming discovery. The weapons sent secretly by France months earlier have only now arrived, and many of them aren't working. Some of the muskets are fitted with the wrong cartridges. Others have shot of the wrong size. It renders them unusable. On the opposing side, the British are trying out a new and improved rifle. Captain Patrick Ferguson, a skilled marksman, is the inventor. The new weapon is lighter, has a longer range, and in Ferguson's expert hands is deadly accurate. During the fighting, the captain gets a high-ranking officer in his sights, but killing involves more than aim. On the 18th century field of battle, there is also the matter of honor. The American Revolution occurs during what some historians term the age of limited warfare. These professional military officers who deemed themselves professionals did not think that it was gentlemanly nor honorable to intentionally lay low an enemy officer. It's an easy shot, but Ferguson passes it up. His decision possibly changes history. The man at the end of his barrel was, evidence suggests, George Washington himself. Four o'clock strikes on the field at Brandywine. The Continental Army has successfully held off the British advances for eight hours, but all of that is about to change. What Washington doesn't know is that his main force has only been engaging half of Howe's army. The other half has been sent on a day-long march to the west, around the American defenses, and is now headed for a surprise attack from behind. It is the same tactic the British used at the Battle of Long Island, and once again, Washington is surprised by the maneuver. Having outflanked the Americans, the battle quickly becomes a rout. One thousand American soldiers are wounded or killed. Washington is forced to retreat north, giving up the fight and giving up Philadelphia. Six weeks later, the news reaches America's emissary to France, Benjamin Franklin. His hometown, the rebel capital, Philadelphia, has fallen to the British. In response, the sage statesman makes an unlikely quip. Instead of Howe taking Philadelphia, Philadelphia has taken Howe. This is not only spin of the finest kind, from a man who, remember, made his name writing hoaxes and, and dispensing misinformation in his own papers. He knows his job, and his job is essentially to make it appear to the Europeans, and particularly to the French, that the American cause is a viable one and moreover, that the Americans can win this contest. Those are all of them, at that point, fictions. Franklin, as shrewd in his diplomacy as he is in his chess, will have to wait yet again. The unanswered question is whether the French will support America in its next move. Monsieur Franklin, in France, we do not take King so. Madame de Bourbon, French Duchess. Ah, madame, we do in America. Back in the colonies, America's northern army is getting ready for a battle that will turn the tide of the war. September 11th, 1777. Washington's army takes on the British at Brandywine Creek. 25,000 soldiers clash but the Americans are outflanked by their enemy. It is another rout for the British, as the rebel capital Philadelphia falls into enemy hands. But British General Howe's decision to take Philadelphia has meant abandoning his northern army. With no knowledge of Howe's choice, General John Burgoyne, leader of Britain's northern army, continues his campaign to take the Hudson. And the gentleman general makes sure he travels in style. 30 carts of food, 
clothing and liquor take the edge off a campaign through the rugged terrain of upstate New York? Tonight, he is confident and in good cheer. Burgoyne has enlisted help in his campaign, a secret weapon that he believes will give him the upper hand. 500 Native Americans from the League of the Iroquois have joined Burgoyne's army. They will serve as guides to the British, helping them navigate the northern frontier. The Indians were not really interested in, in theories of, uh, of monarchy versus democracy. The Indians were playing it according to what, how is this going to play for us? Which side is going to be most likely to, to grant us our sovereignty? Who is our greatest friend and conversely, who is our biggest threat? Each Indian nation has to make a choice. Um, virtually none are able to remain neutral. Most, overwhelmingly, they side with the British. For the Native Americans, it is a marriage of convenience. A British victory is their best hope for protecting their lands against the westward-pushing American colonists. Burgoyne partakes in the ancient practice of sharing a peace pipe but he wants the Indians to attack the Americans without mercy and wastes no time broadcasting his objective, issuing a proclamation to the inhabitants of New England, a warning to all who stand in his way. I have but give stretch to the Indian forces under my direction and they amount to thousands to overtake the hardened enemies of Great Britain wherever they may lurk. The messengers of justice and of wrath await them. General John Burgoyne. Burgoyne's proclamation is a fateful decision. July 27, 1777, Western Vermont. Two braves capture a woman by the name of Jane McCrae. There is a struggle, a fight, a shot is fired. Jane McCrae dies, but it is unclear who killed her. There are varying versions of this story, and some contend that, in fact, she was killed by militiamen firing on the Indians in an attempt to rescue her. However she actually met her fate, this is one of those sort of events that's prone to being manipulated for propaganda purposes. The story spreads through the colonies with lightning speed and becomes fodder for brutal anti-Indian propaganda of the highest order. It is written that bloodthirsty Indians have killed a white woman and Burgoyne is held accountable. Back in the British camp, the scalp of Jane McCrae is presented to Burgoyne, who receives it with disgust, even though he is the one who ordered the raids. The savages, having scalped a young lady, their prisoner, fills me with horror. I would rather put my commission in the fire than serve a day if I could suppose government would blame me for such strong acts, such unheard barbarities. But Burgoyne's reaction is too little, too late. The killing of McCrae becomes a call to arms. Militia grab their muskets and head to the Hudson Valley and begin to pour into continental camps. For General Horatio Gates, who arrived on Washington's orders in August to take over as leader of America's Northern Army, it is the boost he has been waiting for. Gates is a proud, albeit disheveled, man who comes from a clouded past. Born in Britain to a servant mother, he is rumored to be a bastard son. America has given him an escape from the rigid class structure of Europe. War, a chance to gain glory against his former home. But he harbors even greater ambitions. Horatio Gates wanted to be commander-in-chief of the American army. And it goes much beyond that. Uh, whoever was the victorious leader of the revolutionaries would, the emer would emerge as the leader of a new nation. There had to be a new ruler, some new kind of ruler. No one had decided what yet. Um, I think he might have been that ambitious and that foolish. Gates adds fuel to the furor over the killing of Jane McCrae, writing an open letter directly to his adversary that the famous Lieutenant General Burgoyne should hire the savages of America to scalp Europeans and the descendants of Europeans is more than will be believed in Europe. They are harsh words to an old friend. 
Gates knows his rival, John Burgoyne, well. In the Seven Years' War, they were comrades in arms, registered one after the other in the British military ledger as gentlemen to be lieutenant. Now, Gates sees his chance for glory. In beating his old country and gentleman Johnny Burgoyne, he will prove himself to Congress, which, to him, still doesn't recognize his worth. Gates orders his army to a position where he knows the British will have to pass, just south of a region of New York called Saratoga. Gentleman Johnny Burgoyne continues his southward march, but there is no sign of reinforcements. Burgoyne has made a fateful decision to press forward rather than wait for news from Howe. Clues as to what lies ahead are all around him. A royal patrol scouting close to Saratoga comes across a note pinned to a tree. Burgoyne had posted his proclamation. Now the rebels have issued one of their own. Thus far shalt thou go, and no further. September 19, 1777. With numbers swelled by anti-Burgoyne sentiment, the rebel army is ready for a fight. Horatio Gates sees an opportunity to test the British just south of Saratoga on a piece of land called Freeman's Farm. Gates has a surprise for his enemy, an elite force sent by Washington himself, Daniel Morgan's rifleman. Morgan, a Virginia officer, fought in the Seven Years' War, witnessing firsthand the fighting style of the Native Americans. Inspired by what he saw, he has created guerrilla tactics that are new to the battlefields of the 18th century. Rather than attack in columns head on, Morgan's men fire from cover. Noon. After a tough morning march through heavily thicketed woods, a forward picket of Burgoyne's army finally reaches a clearing. A moment to rest, they think. But Morgan's men are waiting. Fire rains down with deadly accuracy. All but one British officer is killed or wounded in the first assault. The ambush is followed by bloody skirmishes, the battle swinging back and forth through the afternoon. Until finally, at four o'clock, having inflicted their damage, the Americans fall back. The British suffer 600 casualties to the American marksmen come to understand that these rebels may not give up so easily. In the American camp, militia keep pouring in. The army swells to more than 10,000. Victory against the 5,000 British soldiers now seems possible. Horatio Gates can feel it. So too can another general who wants to capture some glory for himself, Benedict Arnold. But before the two generals take on Burgoyne, they will find themselves in a battle against each other, each vying for credit in a campaign that will change the course of the war. The battle at Freeman's Farm, just outside of Saratoga, New York, has stopped British General John Burgoyne's southward march in its tracks, and given confidence to Horatio Gates' troops, whose numbers continue to swell. That confidence is shared by another bold American general who sees his chance for glory, Benedict Arnold. Arnold comes from a prominent Connecticut family that fell on hard times. His alcoholic father squandered away the family's fortune. But Arnold would not yield to his lowly circumstances, achieving great wealth and success in business through sheer will. He has been in the war since the outset and has always made an impression. He was spit and polish. When he sat on a fine horse, uh, he was literally a commanding figure. Men, men looked up to him. It was Arnold who helped snatch Fort Ticonderoga from the British two years earlier. But the credit for the victory went to the hard-drinking frontiersman, Ethan Allen. It is a slight that Arnold has not forgotten. But this campaign offers him a chance at redemption, to get the credit he feels he deserves. Meanwhile, around Saratoga, New York, 
the two armies wait, just miles away from each other. They wait, as soldiers do, for their next order. In the American camp, Gates and Arnold talk strategy over a meal of ox heart. Their army has swelled to twice the size of Burgoyne's. The question is, what to do next? And the two generals have two different ideas. Arnold, ever on the offensive, proposes an aggressive act, an attack on Burgoyne. Gates, however, is characteristically circumspect. Let Burgoyne come to them. The conversation turns heated, tempers flare. Horatio Gates couldn't stand Benedict Arnold, considered him an upstart, an arrogant upstart. And Benedict Arnold, like many of the revolutionary soldiers, called Gates Granny Gates, a fussy old woman. <laughs> But the headstrong Arnold takes his argument one step too far. Gates, in no uncertain terms, reminds Arnold that it is he who is the ranking officer. And Gates banished his best general from the dinner table, insulted him, wouldn't let him come to meetings, told him basically, stay in your quarters, which were a little hot on the, on the edge of the battlefield. And Benedict Arnold fumed as a result of that dinner and decided that he would have to defy the orders of his commanding officer because he believed the Americans were going to be beaten if it were up to Granny Gates. In the British camp, General John Burgoyne is filled with frustration. News has finally arrived from Howe. There will be no reinforcements coming from the south. But gentleman Johnny Burgoyne refuses to retreat. Burgoyne is exceptionally ambitious. He is definitely a glory hunter. But his greatest failing was that, like many officers of his time, he placed a premium on individual martial glory. He wanted to gain fame for himself. Saratoga should have never happened. Johnny Burgoyne's pride, his hubris, is what precipitated the disaster at Saratoga. With his supplies dwindling, Burgoyne decides to make one last push. An assault on the Americans just to the south of Saratoga on a rise of land called Bemis Heights. October 7, 1777. Burgoyne sends a reconnaissance force of 1,500 towards the American lines. Gates sets 2,400 of his men out to meet the British. It is the final engagement of the Battle of Saratoga. On the field, Benedict Arnold, in defiance of Gates' orders, leads the charge against the Royals. Arnold employed snipers. He got riflemen, highly accurate, put them up in trees like snipers, not down in red uniforms with white stripes that you could sight. Arnold um, fought like an Indian, from cover with camouflage, um, surprise attacks. It was a new kind of warfare, and the British didn't adapt to it. Through the smoke of battle, Arnold spots an opportunity he can't ignore. British General Simon Fraser seems to be single-handedly rallying the troops. Arnold makes a snap decision that changes the course of the fight. He orders his men to target the British officer. One month earlier, George Washington may have been spared assassination at the Battle of Brandywine. But at Saratoga, British officers are offered no such favor. It takes three shots. Three shots that take down his adversary. 
With Fraser removed from the battle, the life seems to disappear from the British soldiers, who begin to retreat under the pressure of Arnold's advance. But not before taking a well-placed shot of their own. Benedict Arnold takes a bullet to the leg and barely survives being crushed by his horse. When the battle was over, his second-in-command said, Sir, where are you hit? And Arnold said, It's my leg. I wish it had been my heart. And I do, too. I wish it had been in his heart, because if he had died at that moment, he would have been the great hero of the revolution. With Arnold's leadership, the British attack is repelled and the campaign to take the Hudson comes to an end. Yet it is Horatio Gates who will take the credit for the victory. Gates doesn't mention Arnold in his dispatches and garners all the glory for himself. The people and the press hail Gates as the new American hero. In fact, the hero of the battle was Benedict Arnold. October 17, 1777, noon. Two generals meet each other on a field of surrender. After a seven-month campaign down the Hudson, General John Burgoyne comes face to face with his old colleague, Continental General Horatio Gates. Burgoyne's ill-fated journey ends here with the surrender of 6,000 of his soldiers the largest capture of British forces in the entire war. Burgoyne will return home a prisoner of war, losing not only his year-old wager, but his military career. General William Howe, who delivered Philadelphia to the British with the best of intentions, has had enough. No one in Britain is celebrating the capture of Philadelphia. Instead, they blame Howe for not coming to Burgoyne's aid. Just five days after the surrender at Saratoga, Howe prepares his resignation to return home, leaving behind the rebels and the war that should have ended long ago. Across the Atlantic, America's envoy to France, Benjamin Franklin, receives the news. The victory at Saratoga has changed the war and changed the world. I don't think anyone was as surprised by the news of Saratoga as Franklin. There had been nothing but bad news from the colonies. It's fair to say certainly that he is waiting for something like this. Saratoga is certainly the thing which finally puts him in a position to be able to sign the deal with the French. Benjamin Franklin has played his game perfectly. Now the next move is his. He dons his old blue velvet suit, the same one he wore three years ago on the fateful day the British Ministry all but accused him of treason. He wears it again, at last, to Versailles and a meeting with the French leadership. The news of victory at Saratoga is exactly what France's King Louis XVI wants to hear. He pledges his army and, more importantly, his navy to the American cause. It amounts to a declaration of war between France and England. The American Revolution, which started as a far-off colonial uprising, is now a world war. They might be celebrating in Paris, but as the winter of 1777 takes hold, General Washington has less to be joyous about. Horatio Gates' anointment as the hero of Saratoga again raises questions over who should be in charge of this army. Philadelphia, New York, and large parts of the colonies remain in British hands. Washington must turn his army and his leadership around, for the biggest battles still lie ahead. Next time on The Revolution, a mysterious Prussian will arrive at Valley Forge to train the only army that will have him, Washington's battered Continentals. Baron von Steuben's genius was the ability to distill state-of-the-art European drill tactics to this raw material that was the American soldier. That army and its commander are now convinced that they can beat any army on the face of the earth, and they are eager for the fight. And that fight comes on one of the hottest days of the war.